broadcast is live. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. We have a really exciting conversation coming up today. Let's give it a few minutes um, before we get started. We can have everyone filter into the virtual room. Um, but I just wanted to say how thrilled I am to be speaking today with two scientists who I really admire. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so thank you so much for being here. And um, I can't tell how many folks we have joining us, but I'll just give it another second for people to come on before we get started. I'll drink my tea, give it another, another half a minute. Okay, we're a minute past, so let's get going. Um, Tim Neat Cafella is a doctoral candidate at the Bren School, UC Santa Barbara, and her dissertation research is focused on understanding microplastic sources, pathways, and fate in urban soils and coastal environments. And prior to UCSB, Tim Neat received her bachelor's and master's in biology from Rutgers University. And we have Dr. Ezra Miller, received Zier PhD from the University of Wisconsin, where Z researched plant uptake and accumulation of organic contaminant mixtures. And currently, Ezra works as an environmental scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute, studying emerging contaminants, including microplastics. And my name is Lisa Ertl. I'm the manager of science and innovation at Five Gyres, and will be the moderator for our discussion today. So thank you so much, Tim, Need, and Ezra for being with us. So first, a question for you both. Um, many of us are familiar, I think, with plastics in watersheds and the ocean, um, although the sources and the fate of microplastics in terrestrial systems is certainly less understood. So a question being for you, you know, what do we know about some of the sources of microplastics into agricultural systems? And maybe, Tim, Need, um, maybe you can, we can start with you since you recently co-authored a study that showed emissions of microfibers into terrestrial ecosystems and how that's growing. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for having us <laughs> today. Um, so yeah, there are certainly different pathways of uh, microplastics into our agricultural systems, particularly soil systems. Um, one that we noted in a paper that we recently co-authored specifically on microfibers, was biosolid application. So biosolids are truly amazing nutrient <laughs> components um, that come out of our wastewater um, that have been applied onto land in the past, you know, just as a fertilizer because of how nutrient rich they are. However, um, unfortunately, a lot of them tend to have quite a bit of microplastics as well as other like pharmaceutical byproducts, among other things in them. Um, so that is certainly a way that they can end up in um, soil systems, particularly in agricultural settings where there is biosolid application. Um, another way that most certainly can also be a source is uh, by the use of um, what you call it, agricultural plastics, specifically for weed suppression. Uh, plastic mulch um, <laughs> can certainly be another way that they enter these systems. Um, so yeah, those are some a couple of the sources that um, uh, that I have that that came to mind when talking about agricultural systems. And does it vary a bit on based on geography? Maybe Ezra, you could even talk to what sort of other plastics that you've seen in places where you've worked. Yeah, so I just, I mean, I agree with Tim Neat that those are probably the major sources. Um, but another source that we don't really quite understand yet is um, air deposition. So there's lots of uh, plastic floating around in the air. And um, there have been some recent publications showing that um, plastic, like microplastics in stormwater in the middle of the country have a, a big um, input of those is actually from air deposition from the ocean, spitting up microplastics and other plastic um, use ending up uh, in the air and um, the microplastics can travel pretty long distances. So we see microplastics like in the Arctic and Antarctic way far from any plastic use. And um, so 
there's probably a significant source of microplastics from the air, but we haven't really been able to quantify what that looks like yet. Right, and probably depends on a lot of things, how air moves, how close to a city you are, what sort of things are getting resuspended from, like you mentioned, from the ocean as a source to the, these microplastics can come up and wave bubbles, which I find pretty fascinating. Um, so when, when these plastics are getting into the soil, either landing on it from the air or getting biosolid applications or, you know, this plastic mulch, like to me, you mentioned, um, how do plastics move within the soil profile? Do they, do they run off the surface? Do they, do they move within um, the profile in soil? To me, could you talk a little bit about um, fate and movement? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with microplastics in soils, um, there are numerous ways <laughs> that they can go down that particular uh, soil profile. Um, if the soil itself is somewhat very impervious, not like not not entirely pervious as it should be um it could that it just like runs off um a little bit but there is that it can go down the soil profile um one of them being and there's quite a bit of research that has come out about this is soil fauna like earthworms you know we call them our soil ecosystem engineers you know they're the ultimate engineer of our soil systems um they uh, have the capability to actually move microplastics down so that's a that's one way that it can move down um the soil profile another way too is through water right so for example if you have water that's trickling down um into this soil system System that's microplastics, depending on their size, uh, depending on uh, their shape, um, it could really influence where they end up with that soil profile. Um, so with soils, we tend to have things that are like pores, right? And that's how water trips down, um, down a soil profile. Um, so if the microplastic is smaller than that uh, pore, as the water is trickling, down it can probably go down further um so yeah that those are definitely ways that um microplastics move in soil systems um yeah yeah <laughs> primarily those are the two major ways that i've seen in the research uh, that have identified um uh, microplastic movement and Ezra, so when we see these sources of microplastics being things like air and and biosolids and plastic mulch, um, and then the, the movement and fate being things like water and biota, like the ecosystem engineers, and runoff. Are are the similar? Are there similar sources and um, and movement of organic chemicals, for example, or other persistent chemicals? Yes, definitely. Um, so Timmy already mentioned that a little bit with biosolids. I also want to point out that microplastics themselves are both a particle and a collection of chemicals. And we can't necessarily separate out those two sets of effects or like existence. So plastic is not just one thing like polypropylene. It usually has a whole bunch of different types of additives to give it the properties that are really useful and why we use the plastic in the first place. But what that means is that a microplastic particle is going to have a whole bunch of other types of chemicals as part of it and it's going to um, be able to transport those chemicals through the environment as a result um, and not only that but chemicals that are in the environment because they have been released from other sources may also interact with those microplastics um, so it's pretty complex but yeah um, i guess the one uh difference is that a lot of um, the more emerging contaminants that we're concerned about are not necessarily going to be have a big source in air the way that microplastics may. Um, that's going to be most of them are, are um, not very volatile. And so they're going to be more in the water, especially. Um, and especially if um, we're thinking about water that has been used for various things and then treated, um, water treatment is not effective at uh, removing a lot of these compounds, especially emerging contaminants that the treatment is not designed for. So that's where a lot of these compounds will also be uh, moving into the agricultural systems. Right, because our treatment systems are sometimes 100 years old and got, was really good at removing bacteria and E. coli, but not so good with PVDEs or perfluorinated chemicals and those, those sorts of things. When um, 
when Ezra mentioned, you know, that microplastics are not a monolith, there are all these different polymers or all these chemical additives to me, you were really like shaking your head and be like, yes, <laughs> so true. Um, could you maybe talk a little bit about, because I know a lot of your work is on microfibers and what sort of um, chemicals that you're interested in. And, and, and I, I think a lot about this too, of, you know, what is getting into these agricultural systems from something like microfibers, which can have a lot of chemicals. Um, absorb to them. Yeah, um, so definitely agree with Ezra's point that um, we always have to think about microplastics as not just being these inert um, entities that enter these systems. They are actually a suite of contaminants. That's something that's said quite a bit um, when we're talking about microplastics, as well as, you know, they're vectors, like Ezra said, um, for any other contaminants that they may come across, right? Um, so uh, one thing that is problematic about having these microplastics within soil systems is the desorption of, or rather the like movement of the chemicals that are in these added, that, that are in these um, polymers that make them the polymers that we need for the particular, you know, uses that we have for them, um, moving into that soil system. Um, and as a result, especially if you have quite a bit of it, and as a result, it could potentially affect, say, microbial communities that are present within those soil systems that are incredibly important to ensure that our soil is healthy, that are incredibly important to ensure that, you know, their interactions with plants, which they have a long history um, that's been recorded in science about plant microbe interactions and how great that there's this mutualistic relationship between microbes and plants, how that could be potentially compromised as a result of having these chemicals introduced within these particular systems. So that's something to also consider here, that they're not... Um, they're not inert. They're not. They're, they're not like these entities that are just like, okay, they're there. That's fine. No, they can actually affect um, microbial communities that that are necessary for us to grow good food, right? As well as um, they can affect. Um, what do you call it? The properties of the soil itself. So, for example, there's been quite a bit of research that changes the porosity, meaning the ability of like having water trickle through um, within soil systems. Um, there's been research that has uh, come out about just like how it may shift the physical properties of, of within those uh, soils, and that itself could also affect you know plant growth moving forward. Uh, depending on like the amount that actually enters that system, right? The amount of microplastics that are present within those soil systems. So um, yeah, that's why I was nodding enthusiastically because that's something to, you know, take note about this. You know, there's a lot of research emerging about their effects within soils as well as their effects with plant, uh, effects on plants um, because this, is something that remained understudied and is very much something that we need to pay attention to because we eat, right? Um, and what we eat comes out of the soil. So I think we need to pay attention to that. And could we talk a little bit about effects to, to plants, um, which you mentioned, and then maybe we can go a little bit into how we can use what we know about other chemicals to inform how microplastics might be impacting the soil. So, so to me, what do we know about how microplastics can, for example, impact um, plant growth? So there's a lot that that research topic is presently emerging. So I cannot say with, you know, gusto that this is what happened. Um, but, you know, there have been hypotheses that um, as a result of having, um, say, the disruption between the plant and the microbes that are within these um, soil systems, um, as a result of having those chemicals, say, come off or the changes of the soil properties themselves, that can be uh, problematic in terms of, you say, uh, growth output of those crops, right? Um, there is quite a bit of research on that, so I can't really talk to this particular point um, about that, um, like I said with Gusto, but it's it's very much emerging about um, how the, how the presence of these microplastics may interrupt those interactions um, and potentially affect the output of the uh, the output of uh, the plants that we have or the crops that we're growing. Right. Um, it's such yeah, a new field, but... right? We for so long we've been focused on these marine and aquatic ecosystems. Mm -hmm. It's only recently, in the last you know 
half a decade where there's been a lot more focus and attention put into terrestrial systems. So it's definitely an emerging field and um, it's great that there's, there's this work um, yeah. on it. Um, and so if we could just shift back maybe to chemicals a little bit, I'm wondering, you know, what sort of, um, what we can use the existing, our existing knowledge on um, contaminants to maybe help inform um, effects on of microplastics on soil. So, so thinking about how certain microplastics can have lots of chemicals um, added to manufacturing, things like dyes and finishing chemicals. Um, some fibers have formaldehyde, there's PBDEs, uses flame retardants or perfluorinated chemicals for water and stain repellents on clothing. I could go on and on and on. There are all these chemicals and chemical mixtures. And Ezra, I know you've done some work on chemical mixtures. So, so wondering um, what should, should people who are researching microplastics in soil um, look to from the organic chemical contaminant world? Yeah, so I would say that the idea of thinking about chemicals as mixtures in toxicology and environmental move, fate um, movement through the systems is also really new and still sort of emerging. Um, historically, we have been thinking about chemicals kind of as their single um, systems and not really thinking about how they interact. And so there's a lot we still don't know about how mixture effects um, can happen. I would say um, in terms, I'm more of a toxicologist, so I don't know as much about the soil eff uh, effects, but um, in terms of toxicology, one really useful tool is um, adverse outcome pathways or AOPs, um, which is a way of looking at, instead of each individual chemical, thinking about the effects. So if this happens at a cellular level, how does that translate to something that happens at the whole organism level? And so lots of different chemicals can have the same AOP, the same pathway of effects. Um, so starting to think about which pathways of effects we are concerned about or most interested in, most likely to see happen in the organisms that we're interested in can really help us and I think that that is starting to be something that microplastics researchers are thinking about, but it's very much in the early stages. And do you think those adverse outcome pathways can be used? You know, we, we get the question all the time of what are the impacts of microplastics to human health? Is this a technique that can be used for risk assessment for microplastics in drinking water, microplastics in our food systems? For sure. Um, it's really important to know what kind of end effects you were concerned about before you can do a risk assessment. And so having that connection is a really great first step for um, getting towards a risk assessment. An AOP doesn't necessarily tell you or it like, does not tell you what concentration of a specific chemical is of concern. So there's more research to do on that, but it's a really helpful step in doing those risk assessments. And just to a little plug in California, we are kind of finishing up our first um, establishment of threat, not regulatory thresholds, but scientific thresholds that we would expect microplastics to um, have concerning effects for aquatic systems. And then we also did take a look at human health um, for drinking water. And at this point, there's not really enough information for us to have a threshold for human health, but we do know we're starting to understand some of the effects of microplastics on all these different organisms. So that's really exciting. And when we think about, you know, effects to, to human health, um, what are some of the equity issues around contamination of soil, um, especially in urban areas where, to me, I know you've done a little bit of work. Um, is contamination of soil by plastic another injustice for communities that already have limited access to green space and agricultural areas? Yeah, no, 100%. It is. <laughs> And I say this with such confidence because um, there's so much research that's emerging about the effects of uh, plastic contamination in soils, but um, that could yield some really horrible outcomes. Say, like I said, I can't 
probably say this is what it does to plants fully because that's not what I particularly study. Um, but um, for example, if there's a presence of all of these, you know, microplastics, um, which are, you know, having these different contaminants in introduced additives and stuff that are entering these soil systems, and that could be potentially harming, you know, the different flora and fauna that are within these like urban green spaces, um, that's a problem. That's a very big problem because these green spaces not only um, provide for us, um, uh, which call it, you know, it does it doesn't only yield mental and uh, mental health and physical health benefits, right? Um, it's helpful when it comes to cooling within um, these uh, really tightly, you know, er highly urban systems. Um, it helps with, you know, lowering the volumes of stormwater <laughs> that are coming through, um, say, when you have a storm, for example. Um, so ignoring uh, the justice aspect of this or ignoring how this might potentially affect um, people who live in urban areas is something that I think that the microplastic community should really focus on um, because um, <laughs> largely because I feel like um, the people, well, the truth of the matter is that, you know, we're highly ar ar urbanizing our world, right? So by 2050, we expect more than 50% of our global population to be living in cities. Um, we need to also ensure that, you know, the very people who benefit from these green spaces have healthy green spaces, right? Um, I'm a city kid. I benefited from those green spaces. I'm in the environmental space because I got the opportunity to interact with spaces like these. But if we do not pay attention to the types of contaminants that are entering these systems and how they can be problematic for those systems to thrive, um, it may be an issue to the community who really benefit from having that system nearby, as well as um, makes me wonder a lot of the time about who we're designing the environmental future for, right? So we really need to need to think about all of these benefits um, that these spaces provide for us um, and provide for the most vulnerable uh, populations who are affected by uh, having continuous po uh, pollution in their spaces. So I definitely, definitely do agree that uh, we need to pay attention to how plastics are contaminants within urban soils because somewhere down the line, it's going to be very problematic, um, especially if we don't try and study it presently and try to understand what could be happening. And we do know it's a big problem for urban spaces, right? When you measure microplastics in the air, when you look at yeah. stormwater runoff, um, yeah. Maybe you could talk, Ezra, a little bit about some of your experiences from San Francisco, of like what kind of particles you see in stormwater and in air or, um, in an urban setting like San Francisco. Yeah, so historically, the microplastics community has kind of focused on wastewater, treated wastewater. And while that's very important, um, we've shown in San Francisco Bay that actually stormwater has way more microplastics and in most of the Western US, um, their stormwater is not treated before it gets into our surface waters, like our rivers and estuaries, et cetera. And so that's kind of a concern. <laughs> um, and a lot of uh, the microplastics that we're seeing are um, types of plastic that we haven't necessarily been thinking about as much. So. Um, for example, in the San Francisco area, about half of the microplastic particles in stormwater are tire wear particles. So when you drive your car, um, your tires, the friction between your tire and the road um, wears down your tires. That's why you have to get new tires. Um, and it creates all of these little part of tiny particles of tire plastic um, that can get into the air and also run off in stormwater. And we know that a lot of the chemicals that are used in tires are, or um, that are in tires and then react with chemicals in the environment, like oxygen in the environment, um, can be pretty toxic. So for example, um, it was recently discovered that uh, a compound called 6-PPD quinone, um, which is uh, an antioxidant product in the tires. So it's six PPD is purposely put in the tires to keep it from breaking down and it reacts with ozone in the air and creates this 
6-PPD quinone compound um, that helps the tires last way longer than they would if it wasn't in the tires. But this compound gets into stormwater and is actually very, very toxic to coho salmon. So it it kills them <laughs> at, very, at very low levels. And we know in all across the, the West Coast that the this compound is in stormwater at lethal concentrations to coho salmon and is probably toxic to a lot of other organisms as well, maybe just not as immediately obviously toxic, um, but has more subtle effects. So that's just one example of how urban stormwater is uh, <laughs> has these microplastics and has separate concerns from the wastewater that a lot of microplastics folks have historically been focused on. Mm -hmm. And also an example of how toxicologists can really look for a smoking gun. It's such a fascinating example of finding a particle in the environment, looking at the chemical mixture of rubber because there are dozens or hundreds of chemicals in that rubber and, and eventually narrowing it down to a single compound that really seems to be driving the effect. You know, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of work to get there because these plastic particles, they're such a mixture of different different chemicals and it's, it's sometimes hard to know um, what could be driving an effect and causing an effect to things like fish. To think a little bit about plants and, and agricultural systems and, and the chemical relationship between, um, or the relationship between chemicals and, and plants, um, what do we know, Ezra, about how you know these chemicals are are impacting other organisms? You know, other than other than things like things like fish, how these chemicals might be getting into plants, um, affecting plants, or affecting the people that are that are eating them. Sure, for sure. So the quick answer is we don't know a lot still, but we do know that a lot of these contaminants can be taken up into the plants. So even if the the plastic particle itself, I I don't think there's a lot of evidence thus far because no one has studied it of plastic um, microplastics being taken up into the plants. Um, so that's a mystery whether that does or not. But we do know that chemicals that are often associated with microplastics are taken up into the plants and can end up in the edible parts of the plants. And there's also some limited evidence that the people who are eating those crops are also exposed. So I'm gonna use an example that's not necessarily microplastics specific, but is from treated wastewater. So um, a lot of pharmaceuticals in treated wastewater, um, there are a lot of pharmaceuticals in treated wastewater because like I said earlier, the treatment isn't necessarily designed to remove them. Um, and so if you irrigate uh, crops with treated wastewater or use biosolids for fertilizer, then these pharmaceuticals end up in the soil system and can be taken up by the plants. And so there was a study in Israel a few years ago where they gave people baskets of produce that were grown with um, treated wastewater and also other people had baskets of produce without any um, wastewater involved in their growth. And then they measured carbamazepine, which is an anti-epileptic drug that is almost always found in treated wastewater, um, in the all of the these volunteers' urine after two weeks or something where they had been eating however much of the food that they were given that they wanted. And there were measurable levels of carbamazepine in all of the people in the urine of all of the folks who had been eating the wastewater grown produce. Um, and none of them took carbamazepine at, for epilepsy or like as uh, it is needed for some people. So we know that people can uh, be exposed to these chemicals um, that are, are growing or that are uh, getting into the plants as we grow the plants. Um, and I would guess that it would be similar for a lot of other compounds, but once again, we don't have the, the scientific evidence yet of that, no one has studied it. Yeah, we don't yet know if the same could be true for microplastics or nanoplastics. Um, and what, as that work progresses, Timney, maybe you could talk a little bit about the importance of you know transparency in science and and how um, how this sort of research um, needs to be reproducible for um, the our knowledge to really move forward. 
Yeah, um, certainly one thing that is incredibly helpful is being transparent about what you're doing and how you're doing it, right? Um, because, you know, forming a research question, coming up with methods to address that particular research question, there's always going to be trade-offs, right? So some things are going to are going to be missing. <laughs> some things are to be present, right? Um, and having that level of transparency allows us to say, for example, if I were to read a method that Ezra, so that you published, um, and I was like, hey, that'd be really cool to try out, stay in my small little town of Santa Barbara and see if, you know, um, microplastics are in fact leaching out these contaminants into soils next to a major park, right? Um, and I follow what and leverage whatever particular kind of stuff that you've published to kind of evaluate that. Like that level of transparency is incredibly important uh, for me um, to be able to repeat the work and see if what I'm seeing is what you're seeing. But also at the same time, um, also, uh, science is very much a living thing. Um, so it allows me to innovate, right? And try and see what I can do with any kind of missing gaps that are there for me to identify what's going on. Um, biggest issue, and I feel like this is something that we are facing a lot in microplastic research because it's very much a hot topic, is that there isn't transparency. There isn't transparency about of the methods that you're using. There isn't transparency of um, um, how you're doing the things that you're doing and so on. I think in fear of just like making this very flashy statement about what it is that you are specifically doing. And, and yes, it's interesting, but in order for us to be able to, you know, say, test out something, say, you know, we're all in different physical locations, test out something where you are, Lisa, where you are, Ezra, test out something here. Um, that's a really great opportunity, you know, if you are transparent for me to be like, okay, this is what I need to do to be able to address this. Um, it needs to be reproducible <laughs> as a result. I think with transparency, reproducibility, right? Um, and so um, this is incredibly, like, helpful for us to be able to, like, figure out what might be going on um, because, you know, yeah, largely figure out what, what might be going on, but also help us innovate the science further, right? Make the stuff a little bit more digestible, a little bit more accessible to everybody instead of just like kind of like holding on to it ourselves. I think that maybe we can elaborate on that a little bit better. Uh, that's yeah. what I think about in terms of tra transparency and pro uh, reproducibility, especially when it comes to contaminants and studying contaminants, because um, we all need to tackle this together. We can't just do it alone. And um, by having transparent science, that's how we go about doing that. Can I add one tiny thing, which is it's not just for folks who are trying to reproduce the method and do similar research, but also folks who are doing things like risk assessment. We need to understand how you did your work to know whether your results are fit for the purpose of this other thing. Um, so, uh, for example, in this recent risk assessment um, threshold development process that I was involved in, a lot of the studies that we were looking at, we had to say, this is not... Uh, able, we can't use this in, in this risk assessment because we don't know enough about the type of plastic particles that this group was using or what the methods they were using um, were. And so we, we can't say whether or not this result is uh, comparable to these other papers. And so um, it's not just for your other scientists, but all of the like regulators and other folks who are using the science. Yeah, you, you said it beautifully, Ezra. That's exactly what I was trying to get at. Yeah, and I, I think this is probably we could have a whole other discussion about this of like how to make data more open source, how to be more transparent in our methods and reporting because really uh, our science depends on it and, and, and trust in what we're doing and, and being very clear and transparent about um, how we do it. So maybe we'll have to snag you both for another um, whole combo on transparency and and, and science. Um, so just to kind of, we we're, we have about 10 minutes before we're going to move to some questions. So I, I, I wanted to make sure we left some time for solutions at the end, because I think um, 
we are we still have a lot to know about what the effects of microplastics and, and chemical mixtures are in soil. We know a little bit about the sources. There's other gaps like air we don't really know a lot of. Um, but we also know enough, I think, to act from all we, we know about plastic and um, chemicals in soil. Um, so I'm curious to, to know, um, a question for you both, maybe we'll start with Ezra, what sort of innovations um, you've seen to prevent microplastics and chemicals from getting into agricultural soil? Obviously biosolids are an issue. Um, can, can you remove those for large scale agriculture? Um, maybe you can also touch on uh, rain gardens um, as a way to mitigate microplastics, perhaps at a smaller scale, but maybe this could be scaled up. Yeah, so I, I guess I wanna start with a bigger picture thing, which is that there's different places that you can have uh, solutions at. So um, you can start like the, the most effective solution is removing the plastic or the dangerous chemicals from the products in the first place. And so that those uh, cannot get into the environment. And then there are downstream solutions like rain gardens, for example, which are a way of cleaning up stormwater before it gets into various surface waters. Um, but those downstream solutions are only so effective because they're, if we're adding more plastics into the environment, then that is, uh, or more of these chemicals, um, then cleaning it up is kind of the last resort in a lot of ways. That said, um, we have, uh, done a pretty small study on uh, rain garden effectiveness on removing not just microplastics, but a whole bunch of different types of stormwater associated chemicals and found that they're extremely effective. Over 90% of the microplastics that were going into the rain garden were removed. Um, and so that it seems like it's a, a great solution for uh, some stormwater, but those are expensive to implement and you can't necessarily do that everywhere. So I think upstream solutions are really the way to go. Um, the other thing about things like rain gardens is that you still have the substrate that's now full of different contaminants that you have to do something with. So it's kind of a sh short-term solution that then presents its own unique challenges. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say definitely it's the source um, reduction is really the, the way to go with solutions for microplastics. Yeah. Sure. I was going to say, um, Ezra put it beautifully. <laughs> that is essentially mm -hmm. what I was to say. Um, but um, de definitely, I think that I, I agree that it's like a multi-tiered uh, approach. You can't um, really just be like, okay, we're going to create rain gardens or, you know, other like green water, uh, not green water, storm water infrastructure such as um, uh, biofilters or bioswales, right? Because they are very expensive to implement. So that's, that's just like rain gardens are, right? Um, and that to me is just like Ezra said, is a short-term solution. It is a band-aid, right? Um, when really we should be thinking about how we can reduce the amount of plastic that's going into the environment, right? Are we considering material substitution? Are we considering um, holding the producers accountable for whatever it is that they're producing, like particularly the end of life of, of uh, whatever they're, they're producing. Are they being held responsible for that? Um, and so on and so forth. So that's something that we really need to pay attention to when it comes to solutions with micro uh, with microplastic pollution or plastics in general, is that it cannot fall to only say scientists innovating, community members innovating um, on limiting the amount of plastics that are entering like their environments. It has to come from producers. It has to come from a regulatory standpoint as well, um, from governments and so on. So it, it is a team effort and needs to be a team effort <laughs> in order for it to be uh, successful and for us to actually reduce the amount of plastics that are entering these systems. I want to add one more thing, which um, is that w removing plastics is great and awesome and like reducing our use of them, but we also want to be very careful to avoid regrettable substitutions. So historically, there's a lot of examples of us realizing something, a chemical that we were using was 
dangerous and bad for the environment and changing to something new that we thought would be better. And then it turned out that that was also bad. So an example of plastics reduction is all of the um, like single use plastic foodware that you see from restaurants and stuff, um, st like straws and takeout containers, that sort of thing. Um, those are often now being replaced because we don't want that plastic with um, paper products, but those paper products are treated with perfluorinated compounds, which are also um, considered forever compounds. They don't break down easily. They're, they have lots of toxic effects. So that's not necessarily better. It's just different. Um, so being careful to avoid that kind of change um, and find things that are actually truly environmentally friendly and sustainable. But I think at one time they thought that these PFASs were better because they're bulkier molecules, um, bulkier than PVDEs, which are bulkier than PCBs. Um, but the more we really dig into it, I think the science is showing that even these really big bulky molecule, molecules can still translocate, can still cause effects in the same may be true for nanoplastics and microplastics. We have exactly. these theoretical ideas of what could be getting into plants, but um, we've seen, you know, time and time again, some things breaking the, what we thought was a rule um, and how other things can impact um, whether something can translocate. Um, so we talked a little bit about like the different scale and where, you know, where solutions um, can be applied. Um, where do you both see room just in our last couple of minutes before we have um, time for questions? Like, where do you see there being innovation to help prevent um, these plastics and chemicals from getting into the environment? We don't want regrettable substitutions and we want to be careful about what our replacements are. Um, do you think that there's going to be, you know, work from from governments to implement bans? Do you think there's going to be, you know, material redesign designs? Are these going to work in tandem? How do we how do we achieve that? I think that there are already innovations happening, kind of at every level of um, the community. So from individuals coming up with cool ways to change their own behavior, all the way up to um, governments now becoming more aware of microplastics as an issue and starting to think about how to regulate them and everything in between. There have been all sorts of cool innovations that I've learned about recently. So um, one tiny example is that um, there are several startup sort of companies that I know of that are designing um, ways to uh, like collect tire particle dust before it is emitted everywhere. So while it's like attached to your car and while you're driving, it kind of sucks up all the tire particles so they are not emitted. And I would never have thought of that myself, but someone did and they've designed it. And there's, I think, multiple companies doing this sort of thing now. So um, it's happening kind of at all levels, which is really exciting. And when the engineers and biologists can work together, I think that's where the magic happens. We're good at identifying, well, I should speak for myself. I feel like I'm good at identifying problems and then take some really creative people to help try to solve those problems. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, go ahead, Timmy. Uh, I was just going to say, Ezra said it <laughs> well. Um, uh, definitely, I think that... Um, Th those there are innovations that are happening at, at all levels. Uh, one thing I did also encourage all of us is to get rid of the whole out of sight, out of mind kind of ideology when it comes to our waste, right? Being like, okay, we're letting something go. It is what it is. We didn't see it. Um, particularly when we're talking about like plastic exports and trash exports to the global south. That is something to also pay attention to, um, that um, there needs to be a discussion from a regulatory standpoint about how the West is essentially exporting their trash to the global south and how that can be a very big problem for them as well. Um, so I think what I just wanted to say here and emphasize is just that um, maybe also having open discussions and conversations even with your own community members about where our trash goes, what happens to it, um, can also be a great way to limit the our 
contributions as consumers. Or as, I, as we have mentioned earlier, is that it's multi-tiered. Um, consumers are not going to be the only ones that stop plastic pollution. It has to be done at every level. And there's some some interesting studies too, you know, on a, on effects about what happens when we export our waste to the global south. How PBDEs from from chickens that are feeding near some of those dump sites, they're they're ending up in in eggs and and food for people. So um, there's definitely a, a strong chemical connection when we're thinking about the impacts of those those plastics in the global south. And it's really important to keep in keep in mind. Um, so if you, I, I would just say, you know, if you have any questions, please enter them in, into the chat. And um, we have one question here. It's it's about you know material replacements. Um, maybe maybe a regrettable one, maybe not. Um, you know, I was wondering for both of you what your thoughts are on some material placements for existing plastics, um, some of those mulches or, or covering for agricultural fields. Um, is there a place for biodegradable plastics like PHA? Um, maybe not as a long-term fix, but maybe a shorter term fix until um, there's other other practices put in place. I was wondering what your, what your thoughts are on PHA. I think that it's a great step towards more sustainable things. Um, I would say that a lot of Plastics that are marketed as biodegradable are only biodegradable in kind of extreme situations of like uh, very like industrial compost sort of um, systems and not necessarily biodegradable when it's just out in the environment or like in your field. Um, so it is still producing a type of microplastic. Um, but I, it, it's likely to break down much faster than our more traditional plastics and I think is a great step kind of in the right direction. And as we have engineers and chemists design better and better biodegradable um, plastic equivalents, I think that's gonna be really helpful. Um, another thing is I am not 100% sure on this, but I do think a lot of the um, biodegradable plastics don't necessarily use as many of these other additives. So that's great too. <laughs> Tony, did you have more to add? Yeah, um, I definitely, I agree with you, Ezra, that it definitely is um, a great first step. Uh, one thing that I think a lot when we're talking about degradation, specifically biodegradation, is what do we envision biodegradation is? Like, do we just expect it, like Ezra said, do we expect it to just make it smaller? Because um, is that going to be a problem that they are smaller? Or do we expect them to be mineralized? Do we expect them to just be carbon left over, right? Being consumed by different microbes and not really just have anything left behind, have any kind of like material left behind behind. I think that's something that we need to pay attention to when we're thinking about biodegradability, right? Um, are we worried that they're going to make small plastics and that becomes a problem? Um, or like, what is their length as a smaller plastic in the environment? I feel like there needs to be thorough studies um, specifically about different environments of where these plastics may likely end up um, and try to evaluate what be happening there? Are they just becoming smaller and remaining inert? Because them being inert for, say, five years could still be a problem, right? Uh, as opposed to, you know, for uh, other conventional plastics. So it kind of comes off as a lesser evil kind of thing, right? But I do think it's a great first step. And I think that if we are mindful about our mater material substitution, about how uh, we're going to evaluate their you know, um, how they behave in the environment, um, how they break down in the environment. Do they reach the goal of being fully mineralized, fully broken down? Um, I think that, that if, if that is implemented, might have a pretty good um, future with material substitution. Thanks. I have another question in the chat. Um, how can we introduce this issue to farmers who apply biosolids to soils? Um, what is the the best? I think maybe the best way to approach this issue to farmers who um, who do it. That's that's a great question. 
really work in the agricultural space, um, but I assume that the best way could be, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a really great way to go about doing this is having conversations with farmers. Education is definitely necessary. Um, understand why biosolids are in fact helpful for them. Why do they think biosolids are the best option, right? Have a conversation about that because they are excellent what they do. And so it's important to understand why they choose to use biosolids over say some other type of fertilizer um, or some other type of like uh, farming approach. So it's important to have that conversation with them, but also have an open conversation too about what potential trade-offs these biosolids might have for say their crops, right? Because that is their livelihood. So that's something to also like have this openness, you know, don't approach it as you're doing things wrong. <laughs> approach it as let's this conversation about why you choose to use biosolids. Is it cheaper? Is it more beneficial for you? Um, as well as you just being like, okay, so I think that these are trade-offs that you also need to pay attention to and having that conversation with them. It could also be done by incentivizing um, farmers um, by giving them small grants and such if they have to make a costly shift from using biosolids to something else. Incentivizing them could be a really good way to, to ensure that they divest from the use of biosolids in their own work. And there's another question here, maybe Ezra, you could speak to it. It's kind of along the same line and I'll let you jump in. But are there any ways to sort of treat these biosolids or compost more generally for some of these microplastics or chemical contaminants? And I'll let you hop in if you had something to say on. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to echo Tim Need is totally right that everyone is an expert in their own field. So the farmers know all of this stuff. and. Um, I think that it's really important that we consider, okay, the biosolids have these microplastics, which might be a problem, but using other types of fertilizers may also have all sorts of environmental effects that we don't necessarily like. So we have to consider the entire system and, and um, think more large scale when we're offering like, hey, we should switch from this. Um, I am not aware of any um, treatment processes for um, taking microplastics out of biosolids or taking chemicals out of biosolids. I It's not my expertise field, so I may just be missing it, but um, I, I think in general, once microplastics are in any kind of environment, it's quite difficult to take them out. Um, so even just measuring how many microplastics are out in the environment is very difficult. And we're still developing methods for how to measure how many microplastics are in the water, in the soil, or in a fish or in a plant. And so um, I don't think we're quite at the point where we have good methods for removing microplastics, um, remediating the that soil or that um, biosolids, but that's definitely something that I hope there are folks working on. Well, there's definitely so much captured in the biosolids, right? They, you know, all the numbers that I've seen, it's the biosolids are capturing 95 to 99% of the, the microplastics, depending on what level of, of treatment. And I think, Tim, you have that in your, your paper that you published. Um, so, so there's a lot, there's definitely a lot um, there. Um, a, there's a question in the chat about, um, about mulch films um, and sort of, you know, where they're used and how they could be a major, a major source. Um, and it's okay if you don't know the answer, but if, if either of you know the answer of, of the scale of mulch use, um, that would be great. I'll let you jump in. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know the scale of mulch use. However, I do know um, there was a study that had come out uh, pretty recently where they looked at soil samples from 19 different provinces in China and 384 sample soil samples and um, looked at the frequency of plastic mulching with um, with like their samples, right? The correlation. And they noticed there was a strong correlation between where there was plastic mulching and the type and the amount of plastic that they found within that soil system. So that that's been a way, and there's a lot of emerging research that's coming out um, regarding plastic mulch, but that's been a way that folks have been identifying that um, plastic mulch may actually be a major source of uh, plastics within agricultural systems. 
I don't know that much more than to me, um, but I did want to also mention that it uh, we're thinking about agricultural systems as one big thing, but actually there's like lots of different ways of growing. Um, you have to treat every crop sort of differently. And so um, there are some crops that are not going to be a source of microplastics really because they're not using plastic mulch or they don't do as well in biosolids. Um, and there are other crops that maybe we should be focusing on. So like, for example, I know strawberries are commonly used um, with their plastic mulch is commonly used to grow strawberries. So maybe that's somewhere where we should be focusing more of our attention. Great, thank you. Um, another question, um, how much is known about the potential of plastics to bioaccumulate in soil food webs and eventually transfer to broader terrestrial food webs? How could this be impacting the resiliency of ecosystems? And I know you care a lot about, Tim, uh, about resiliency, Tim Neats, maybe I'll let you start. Um, yeah, so not much. <laughs> is the answer to that. Uh, a lot of research is emerging regarding that, um, trying to understand how, you know, the presence of plastics, um, how that might affect soil food webs. So that's something that is um, coming out and that's what people are looking into um, presently. Presently, um, because we're seeing that it's affecting, say, soil fauna like earthworms. You know, they become smaller. They don't pre like it affects the reproductive output, among other things, has been shown. So there are certainly effects that are happening, and then it's also affecting soil microbial communities. So like different pieces are being studied right now, kind of separately. But I do believe that where the research is going is like there's going to be this connection. Sorry, there's a fire truck, <laughs> but. Um, one second. <laughs> um, so yeah, sorry. Um, so these different like facets of these different studies um, are being looked at, but I do believe that there is this movement towards understanding how this affects the soil food web as a whole, as well as potentially other terrestrial food webs. Because like you have mentioned in your question, it certainly would impact the resiliency of ecosystems, especially if there's more and more plastics that are being introduced into these systems over time. I would just add that we know that there is evidence for bioaccumulation through food webs in aquatic systems. So we can uh, uh, take that information and, and apply it that it's likely to be happening in terrestrial systems as well. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> right. Um and sort of related to that, there's another question, Ezra, maybe you could, could answer this first. Um, should we be putting all our efforts into microplastics or rather identifying dangerous chemicals? I don't think those are, an, I don't think that's an either or question. Um, a lot of these are, are connected. Like I said earlier, microplastics are not an inert particle. They have all sorts of other chemicals as part of them. And a lot of the products and things that produce microplastics also have all of these other types of chemicals that are being released into the environment through those products use. Um, and so I think it's it's kind of all together that we shouldn't be thinking of microplastics as separate from the chemicals, but rather thinking of the system altogether. Um, this is a more a comment, not so much a question, but um, there are people working on trialing biodegradable mulch on strawberry fields across the central California coast, um, working with stakeholders to address agricultural plastic in Monterey County. So um, maybe we can all take a field trip. I'll come out to California. Um, Ezra, you can come down the coast to meet. You can go up, I think, to Monterey, and then we can all call, meet in a strawberry field. Um, what are some of the suspected major sources of microplastics that are suspended in the air um, and um, migrating through atmospheric deposition? So many. Um, so we use plastic in so many different things nowadays and uh, using any of those has the potential to create microplastics. But in general, the microplastics that are in the air and undergoing long range transport are generally um, more buoyant. So they're lighter or less dense, um, for example. Um, 
A lot of these are fibers from various textiles. So um, we often think of like clothing and our carpets and indoor textiles like that, but there's also tons of like uh, sources of fibers in the outdoor environment. So things like construction uh, materials um, are can actually be, a, we think, a major source. Also, um, this is understudied, but I, SFEI thinks that it might be a major source. Um, the U.S. and Canada is kind of unusual because we use dryers um, that vent outside without having any kind of like capture. And so um, our use of dryers and the fibers from those is likely to be uh, quite a big source of plastic fibers mm. to the air. And then, like I mentioned earlier, tire particles um, are a pretty major source of microplastics. Mm -hmm. a, there's an estimate that every single person in the US, like your, um, regardless of how much you personally drive, because we use driving to transport all our goods and that sort of thing, um, that it's every person releases the equivalent of like three kilograms worth of tire particles a year, which is huge. That's so much. So um, changing your driving habits might be a good solution, but not everyone can do that for various reasons. Um, but that that is probably also another major source of plastics to the air. And cars are getting heavier, more electric vehicles. It's more um, tire wear. And and we're really interested in, in dryer exhaust and whether secondary filters on dryers could be a solution, especially for urban communities who are, um, as we talked about today, some of the people who are most um, exposed to these airborne microplastics. Um, we're at time and I, I want to make make sure there's there's room for you to continue on with your day and everyone who joined us today. Um, but just quickly, um, in a few, few words, how can people follow um, your work? Ezra, you can go first. So I'm a Luddite who has no social media, <laughs> but uh, SFVI, um, where I work, does have social media. So we do tweet about our various projects there. Um, and then SFVI.org, you can find all of our research um, papers and reports and things uh, are free to read on our website as well. So that's the best way to reach me or to see what I've done. And to me. Um, yeah, I, uh, I have a website, uh, not well done, but it's a website. Uh, it's timneetk.com as well as I uh, have Twitter. I like to tweet, so you can find me on Twitter as at Tim is neat. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for joining us in our chat today and, um, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.